Welcome back, and our illustrious panel is here. John Moore, who has his own radio show, 7 to 9 a.m. Central Standard Time, Monday to Friday. And uh, Ann Morrison, John's website is thelibertyman.com. Ann Morrison, our scientist, uh, she has some interesting topics to talk about today. Her website is homeland-defense-4u.com. Uh, John, give us the latest posts and updates that you're tracking, and uh, then we can kind of put together a thesis of where this is going. And it's a fluid right, thesis, right. but there's some central points that keep recurring. Right. Thank you, Dr. Bill. Well, first of all, uh, there's a ammunition company. It's a private uh, company. The name of it is Federal. And I have a contact inside there, an employee there, who says, quote, unquote, the United States government is taking delivery of all production from this private ammunition company named Federal. I hope to get more clarification in the next uh, few days as to whether that includes 22 caliber ammunition, the most common uh, ubiquitous ammunition on the planet, and also the common pistol caliber, caliber that the federal government cannot and will not use, such as 38 caliber, 357, 25, 32, and so forth. So uh, once I get those clarifications, then uh, we'll know definitely that the federal government is, is doing one thing and one thing only, keeping us from getting our hands on the ammunition that we feel we need. I, I looked at the, uh, at the Google News last night, and I couldn't believe that there was a, an attack against uh, Alex energizing uh, the uh, Congress to actually have a 25-member committee to deal with this government sequestering uh, ammunition. And by, by, as you say, they're actually sequestering ammunition they don't even use to make sure the public doesn't have access to it. So they're literally making police forces have to ration ammunition because they have to stay in practice. Uh, right across the country. This is totally insane. It's unethical. It's, it's, it's an end run around the Second Amendment. And to me, it need, the people involved in this need to be prosecuted and put in prison. Uh, all the people well, right up to Obama, this is another reason for impeachment of Obama, and the people involved with this scheme uh, to try to have an end run on the Second Amendment. Well, it's unlikely that the Department of Justice, had by Eric Holder, is going to do anything of any consequence. Uh, as much as it should be done, it's well, not Congress could do it. Congress could uh, could have him uh, put in jail. Uh, they, they they can actually uh, take measures that can actually put this guy in jail without because uh, it's like asking the jailer to jail himself. You know they. Uh, Eric Holder is a is a monumental criminal. I know that going right back to Oklahoma City, he was involved with a cover up. And they called the Trentadu and Trentadone notes with uh, Jersey Trentadu, the attorney whose brother was tortured and killed in the prison system. And the family got $1.3 million settlement after they electrocuted and tortured him to death. So Eric Holder was involved in the cover-up there along with uh, Margolis, who's in the Department of Justice. These monsters are back at it again, and he has this look on his face like, I don't have my hand in the cookie jar, but the cookie crumbs are all the way up to his shoulder and up his neck. So, uh, I mean, uh, Eric Holder is a, is, a, is, a, is a son of a bitch, and he's, he's a dangerous man. son of a bitch. Yeah. He's a company he, he, man doing what his bosses want him to do, and that's exactly what right. he is. Exactly. Same as the actor-in-chief in the White House who wants to play golf and play in his home in Hawaii and do other crap and has taken more vacations and had more parties and had more time with uh, Beyonce and her, her uh, satanic uh, boyfriend uh, than any other president in history. This is just ridiculous. And we're being taken to the cleaners as they deconstruct the United States and try to bring down our Second Amendment rights. At the same time, we're going to have chaos if a major thing like a CME happens or an avian plague. They want to disable us to protect ourselves from social chaos when things are very likely to happen in the next few years. Well, yes, Dr. Bill. In fact, privately, you were telling me a couple of hours ago your proposed scenario for what's going to happen uh, through the rest of yeah. the calendar year. Well, I think this is what I see, and it's a fluid one. It's not prophetic. If it was prophetic, I'd announce that it was. But here's what I see happening. This year, I expect to see the bond market have a blowout parallel to an avian plague, and I think the ISON comet will be the start of a series of coronal mass ejections built in chunks. And it will primarily affect the southern hemisphere because we're going to be in November when the ISON comet passes the sun and is a sun grazer. So my expect, it's a, expectation is the southern hemisphere is going to hit much harder than the northern. So if you think you're escaping by going south to New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, uh, you might think twice because, in fact, they're more likely to get hit with a much bigger CME. And the northern hemisphere, we're likely to get grazed by it, which will mean partial knockout, and they'll knock out primarily satellites and some ground-based communication and power grid. Uh, but the biggest thing is we're going to end up with um, the southern hemisphere really getting clobbered. 
And, of course, when that happens, it also doesn't just knock it out. It also knocks out the ozone layer and the upper atmosphere. So we're going to get a blast of radiation that's going to knock out crops in the southern hemisphere. So while it's, it's entering into their late spring and summer with a crop, you're going to get massive crop failures from UV strobing from this uh, ultraviolet light uh, stream coming off, the plasma stream coming off the sun. So I expect the famine to go into high gear when the southern hemispheric crops fail. Absolutely. Well, the, the, the crops grown now for human and animal consumption just barely meet the needs. We no longer have the warehouses and elevators full of surplus grain that we had 40, 50 years ago. So uh, a crop failure in the southern hemisphere would quickly lead to dramatic price increases and famine, both. By the way, the largest supplier of, of food to China is the Southern Hemisphere, and that's why most of the crops are pre-brought in Australia, New Zealand, and the Southern Hemisphere, uh, including Aust- uh, in the Southern Africa that's a major wheat producer as well, uh, and the Southern uh, South America. These are going to get clobbered, and I expect to see that we're going to move into high-gear famine by this fall. Uh, that's well, the scenario, and, I, and that's just. And I think also parallel to that, you're going to see a bond market run. You're going to see gold, where literally bullets, gold and silver now. Even if you can buy it at the lower price, people are paying a premium of 20, 30, 50 percent or more to get a possession because it's one to two months wait to even get it. So the so-called paper gold they keep talking about is a scam. It's scamtastic. It's a damn lie, and they really don't have the gold to keep them talking about. And the derivatives right. market and the paper that they're dropping is 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 BS. So what's really well, going on there isn't buying, the gold that they're talking about. If you're buying gold with a six-month delivery time, that means you're buying it from people who don't have it. Right. So what they're doing is they think they might get it. The fact is that uh, people like the Chinese have known this for years, and they've been buying it for every mine on Earth. They're remelting the bars to make sure they don't get scammed with zirconium uh, or tung- I mean, tungsten bars that are coated with gold. So they're remelting the bars. They know that the, that the, quote, the proverbial is going to hit the fan here very shortly. And the Chinese are freaked out completely because they're more likely to have a revolution than any Saudi Arabian or Muslim country because for every new job that they create, they need 10 more people that are actually in the, in the workforce. And their inflation now, because they're doubling their production of uh, output of, of... They can't even close their factories because they have to build hundreds of thousands of new warehouses to store the toys, uh, toasters, and other junk that they make for us because if they slow down their factories, and a lot of them are on... Uh, three days a week production and they have slaves, a quarter billion uh, slaves that are migrating around the country if China loses its momentum, which is going to, as the West starts to kind of clamp down with the bond market run they're going to have a revolution in China, it's going to get real ugly and externally the way that plays out is they get more aggressive externally because they have an internal disaster, that's why we see with North Korea, North Korea is flailing because they're starving to death and they have crop failures there the famine that we're going to enter, I believe, in 2013, 2014, will energize war. W-A-R, war. That's what we're going well, toward. There, there's plenty of precedents, uh, historical <laughs> precedents, to back up what you say as being one of our possibilities. And we're going to bring this back to our usual theme, Dr. Bill. People need to be prepared spiritually and physically, don't they? They yeah, most definitely. John, any other uh, wisdom you see coming here in terms of what you see happening in the next few years? And I say, by the way, this is not the end of the world. If there's a strobing CME, it's not the end of the world. It's a birth pang. What's likely to happen is out of this disaster and the spreading war in the Middle East, which also I expect in the second term of Obama, he is going to be and is the only man on earth, the only one on earth, given the scroll, given George Bush in 2007 January, by the Sanhedrin reconstituting Israel in the sacred city of Zafed. They uh, have given to Obama the only man, just like King Darius of Persia, the right to rebuild the Herodian temple and uh, even to set up the tabernacle of Moses overnight, which they can do literally overnight on the Temple Mount near that little cupola there that's outside of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And that's where they think the actual physical temple was and wasn't exactly where the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the previous uh, uh, Church of St. Catherine. So what will happen is that Obama is the false prophet if he signs the rebuilding of the temple, and that is an absolute, that's as thus saith the Lord. If he okay. signs the rebuilding of the temple, and I believe in the second term, the chances are about 90% plus that it's going to happen. Then Absolutely. you can well, say, Dr. when they start Bill, the blood I'm sacrifice... I'm here and turn it over to you and Dan. Yeah, thanks, uh, John. Uh, amazing news about what's going on. It's uh, getting more clear every day. got some uh, new reports. I'd like you to give us the latest science. And you show me a very interesting curve here. 
uh, and a report too from the Rouge Foundation about the strategic defense of Earth, which we talked about with the Rouge Foundation before. The number of meteor strikes is increasing dramatically in a logarithmic basis since 2005. The number of earthquakes is fluctuating in a sine wave type pattern, and when it gets around 400, uh, I think it's quakes per month uh, worldwide, there is an increased risk of a major superquake. Uh, we know that uh, coronal mass ejections and action at a distance that Dr. Professor McCanny talks about uh, can cause quakes because it hits uh, enough energy transfer to the tectonic plates in the lithosphere to cause a release of energy when it hits what's called the harmonic threshold of the tectonic plates involved. We know that the uh, geotectonic weapons are to pump in harmonic frequency at those particular plate frequencies until the uh, piezoelectric crystals vibrate and the muir resistance between the rock faces drops towards zero. Uh, I've told us before, uh, this is part of the information on chemtrails because it's more than just chemtrails that you can see at the lower atmosphere that changes the albedo of the earth and can create clouds. The higher atmospheric is basically used to pump in uh, energy to change the jet stream to move uh, energy storm cells and also to pump in energy that goes to ground that can affect the tectonic plates and cause earthquakes, volcanoes and geotectonic uh, uh, events including moving magma that can cause major problems such as the uh, upthrust zone that occurred in Aceh, Indonesia back in 2004 that, that can trigger off major quakes. So the earth has been weaponized and uh, beyond the earth being weaponized the passage of comets is a major trigger and the production of CMEs is a major trigger for super volcanoes, super earthquakes and other events happening on the planet. Well, that's right, Dr. Bill, and I think we need to keep a close eye on the sun. Right now, the number of earthquakes per week is well below two, uh, 300. It was creeping up. It crept up from under 200 to just under 400 over the past month, and then just this last week it started falling again. So I think the seismic energy has been reduced from the earthquakes that have occurred. None of them have been what I would call catastrophic, although a lot of people were killed and buildings were Destroyed. Yeah, there were some big ones, though. I think in China, there was recently a lot of people killed. There was a couple of other places where there were some major quakes. I think in uh, one other country over there in the Mideast, it was hit as well. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot more quakes in general. For example, around Japan, there's a 500% increase in 5-plus earthquakes since March of 2011. 500% increase in 5-plus earthquakes. That's a lot which means a seven-level earthquake or greater will completely destroy the, any containment at all of the uh, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear waste depot site, which was previously a site for creating plutonium detonators for nuclear warheads. Uh, you can be certain that the Japanese, with their advanced satellite launching systems, are getting ready for a nuclear war with China and with North Korea, and North Korea being the bad dog of China. So anybody trying to pretend that North Korea could do anything without Chinese cooperation and, and ascension to allow them to do anything is not is living in a dream world. The North Koreans are in a very short choke chain and the Chinese hold that choke chain. Well we've been looking at some um, buoy data that's um, on the web at the National Data Buoy Center and uh, people can look it up. And it looks That's the buoy, uh, that B-U-O-Y, the buoys that are all through the ocean to, to give us a warning about the a tsunami or a major under-oceanic volcanic effect that moves the ocean floor either up or down, right? Right, and, and of course the Americans have the most of those, and uh, they deliberately measured the distance between the top of the water and the and the um, and the ocean floor, and so that's a good way to tell where there's going to be an uplift or or if the ocean floor is falling. And uh, so we looked at that this just recently. And uh, I want to thank the analyst, uh, J.E., uh, I don't want to give her name on the air, because she's not ready to go public yet. But it looks like um, the ocean floor is rising northwest of Australia, and it's rising uh, just at the Arabian, Arabian, Arabian Peninsula, and also in the northwest and off the coast of uh, Central America. And that's probably one reason that we've seen so much volcanic activity in those reason, regions. Yeah, you know, in northwest U.S., you mean like well, Washington, Oregon area along the Cascadia subduction zone? Uh, yes, actually, yeah, right on the Juan de Fuca plate. Yeah, I would think that uh, if I was going to pick areas or, or major earthquake zones that are probably going to go in America first, I'd pick the Cascadia number one and number two would be New Madrid. 
I don't see any activity along the New Madrid, um, but I do see activity off the uh, west coast of, for instance, Mexico and Central America, and we have seen a lot of seismic activity. Now, I'm t- you know, if you if you put the buoy data with the seismic activity, you know, we have um, we have seismic uh, waves, we have earthquakes under Newberry Volcano in Oregon, and what they're they're using Newberry Volcano as a source for geothermal energy. That is, they're drilling down to the to the magma. And then they're going to use that uh, as a, as an energy source for heating. And uh, the problem with that is, well, they put sensors in there, and so now they can see the the magma moving, and and they're measuring the earthquakes. And there's been a lot of activity there. I I'm not so sure I'd want to be drilling down there uh, at Newberry. But in any case, all the Cascade, uh, Mount Hood, Mount Rainier. Um, even St. Helens and down into Northern California, Lassen and Mount St. Helens. Um, um, no, what's the other one? Mount Shasta have all had Shasta. harmonic yeah. earthquakes recently. Yeah. So yeah. So the Cascadia is number one. The reason why I mentioned the New Madrid is there was a lot of activity last year, and it has a different pattern. It tends to be very quiet before things really get going. Remember about a year ago. There was a lot of activity in fault lines connecting between the Gulf of Mexico and New Madrid. Well, yeah, we have a lot of uh, buoys in the Gulf of Mexico, as well as along the west coast and the east coast of the United States, and um, we're not getting any any information out of them that says that the ocean floor is doing anything. So I'm I'm a little well, suspicious uh, that, that, that that's, that that's good to know. That's good to know. Yeah, that's because good to know. Uh, what are we worried about? You mentioned before, uh, and you're one of the first to mention it, is that the um, uh, the presence of these chemicals down there, the um, what do you call them? Uh, Correct it and all the oil. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the actual deposits of, uh, uh, oh, of the, the methane materials. Class rates? Methane class rates, yeah. Methane class rates, uh, those go actually down as deep as two miles from the ocean floor down. And so we have, we're talking about enormous amounts of energy. In fact, it's been estimated the amount of energy stored in methane class rates at the bottom of the ocean is somewhere around 600 times the amount of energy stored in all the proven oil reserves on the Earth. Yeah, this is a really bad thing because the oil companies want to go to natural gas, and so they're they're licking their lips over these methane class rate chambers. Well, the one in the Gulf of Mexico is five miles deep. The one off of northern Japan is about three, two to three miles deep. And Japan already has plans; they're already tapped into their methane class rate chamber. Well, it's just a disaster waiting to happen. All they need to do, what happens is that the methane um, under pressure uh, and uh, they, it absorbs the water, so it becomes hydrated. And when it's when it's highly pressurized, then the water that that each molecule of methane has is like 20. So you've got 20 uh, molecules of water per one molecule of methane. And right. when that uh, gets out and starts shedding, I mean, when the pressure is released and it starts shedding the water, then that methane becomes uh, dangerous as a firebomb. And, and it can, um, it, they could start a methane fire that would extinguish life. Welcome back, and uh, and let's go over the H seven N nine. I just have an IntelliHub report here, and uh, I'm trying to see if we can uh, talk about this. The case fatality rate is twenty percent overall, but for adults, forty percent. Children tend to get the infection and just get sick. Uh, there's probably a lot more cases that are not diagnosed, but it has the potential to shut down civilization, doesn't it? Well, it certainly does, and in fact, they put out a. Uh Three good signs, three bad signs, and three really bad signs. And I'll just go quickly over them. One of them is that all health care in China for the H7N9 is now free. And that's to encourage people who are sick to go, to go into the medical centers. And they think that the number of cases has largely flatlined in the last week. So we're not getting more and more cases, although that still, still seems to be spreading. 
and yeah. um, they have had some. Uh, Shanghai has had some success in limiting new cases. Um, they were able to shut down the uh, poultry markets, and although they say that it's not being carried by the chickens or the geese or the ducks, they think it's being carried by by uh, pigeons. Now the bad sign, the three bad signs are it's spreading. And so, you know, the yeah, I, I think it's spreading. And my guess is that uh, children spread, don't get as sick as adults. Adults, if they present themselves in the hospital, have about a 40% chance of dying. And there's probably a lot of cases where uh, they get subclinical infection and are carriers and spread like typhoid Mary. Those are the wrong combination of things, which means it's uh, a case fatality rate in certain groups, like in adults, is 40%, much lower, less than 20% in children. And there's probably a lot of cases that are subclinical that may just feel like they got the flu and they are carrying it and spreading it, but they themselves don't die or get really ill. And uh, those that combination of factors is the kind of things that could cause a society to shut down while that passes through, which will take 6 to 12 weeks for it to pass through uh, a population. So, well, yeah, they haven't verified human-to-human -human transmission yet, but it's still possible. I'm pretty certain, I'm pretty certain it's happening. Uh, the kind of things I've seen looking at... Uh, uh, the virology reports I've read so far suggest human to human is, is happening, and it's the primary rate of transmission. It's not coming directly from birds, especially the new case now in Taiwan, and the case is up to 1,000 miles away from near Shanghai. So uh, I'm pretty certain it's been spreading human to human. Well, it is tough to identify the birds with the virus because the the sick pol the poultry don't get sick with it, so they can be the carriers, and uh, then the people catch it from the birds or from yeah, other humans. Not, like it's unlikely said. though, for a bird to get to Taiwan from China. So <laughs> well, that's I, don't, true. <laughs> I don't think that, I don't think any birds got any uh, airline pass tickets or were able to you know dinner once they're cooked. By the way, it kills the virus, so. It has to be a live bird that's subclinical and doesn't get ill, and then passes on to a human, and an adult human can get very sick. In fact, if you end up in hospital with this particular flu, you get about a 40% chance of dying, which is pretty darn horrendous. And uh, believe it or not, the cases that are really rapid onset that kill you, like Ebola, those won't spread like a pandemic. It's ones like this that are, to a greater extent in the population, you can spread silently and doesn't kill some people, but certain groups, maybe they have pre-existing health conditions or adults, uh, like it did in 1918, there were a lot of adults with pre-existing conditions that died. If this can induce a cytokine storm in adults and it doesn't do it in children or other groups, it's going to kill a lot of people and it'll shut everything down. And my guess is this is going to occur parallel uh, to an economic collapse and the bond market collapse, which I expect to happen this summer or fall. And I think it'll happen uh, on or before or just after the ISON comet hits, which is probably going to wipe out crops in the southern hemisphere and probably graze or damage our power grid and our satellites in the northern hemisphere. But it won't be the, quote, total kill shot. It'll sort of start a series of CMEs that will cause problems. And, uh, you know, the world is teetering on a war in the Middle East. We've got this uh, avian swine flu plague that's running, and uh, I'm sure that the globalists will try to set up a peace treaty in the Middle East, and things are going to start getting really hairy. In fact, uh, the latest is a 20% case fatality rate. This is enough to shut everything down. And uh, I'll just read a little bit more of the report. Even more alarming is the fact that the virus is over 20% mortality rate out of the gate. If this proves to continue, we could possibly be looking at one of the most deadly viral outbreaks of all time. It's backed by, up by others such as the journalist Patrick uh, De Justo, who wrote, as of today, dividing the number of confirmed cases by the number of deaths makes it look as though H7N9 is especially bad flu. Uh, the worst cases in the third world country in 1918 was 5% case fatality, about 2.5% death rate in America. Uh, so 2.5% of people that got it died in America. Uh, this flu, uh, right out of the gate, is 20% overall and 40% in adults. This is uh, at least four times to eight times more deadly than the 1918 flu. That's not good. Um, well, yeah, the H5N1 has a mortality rate of 60%. But, yeah, but it, it uh, kills so much quicker, though, that it doesn't spread as easily. It doesn't See, if you get H5N1, easy. yeah, it, it's a, got a very rapid onset, and it kills its host so quickly they can't travel. If you can travel in a subclinical or don't even get very sick at all, especially children, children can carry the bug from school home, and daddy gets sick, and then he ends up in hospital on a ventilator and dies. Yeah, that's, that's what, what I see coming. Thinking. Yeah. Yeah, and, so in other words, uh, it's going to hit specific populations. The H7N1 hemorrhagic flu. Uh, the yeah. H7N9 uh, is not hemorrhagic. It is respiratory. It gets into the lower lungs, and you get pneumonia. So it's a uh, different yes. animal. And, uh, it's a different uh, animal altogether. 
Yeah, well, it'll cause a severe secondary pneumonia and alveolar arterial block. So, yeah, it doesn't create this, this cytokine storm you get, but your dead is dead either way. Uh, <laughs> either way, uh, yeah. In other words, believe it or not, it's a less lethal flu in terms of the cytokine storm and so on. With a case fatality rate that can carry a lot of silent cases that don't get sick, it's actually more deadly in terms of looking at the world population. So if you're actually map out with a computer model, the number of people who die, say, from Ebola, it's very small because it kills so quickly. Same as H5N1, it kills so quickly that it doesn't get a chance to spread. But something like this, this can spread and kill a lot more people in terms of millions over a period of, say, six months. So even though the case fatality rate is 20%, if this gets out of the box and starts really spreading, it can actually make more people dead than these other flus. Well, and the other thing that we have to remember is that we don't have a sentinel yet, so we we don't know because uh, the birds aren't getting sick from it, and we know it's not going into the swine population, and so we don't have a way to say when the H seven N nine is is uh, well, in the community. One thing about this is its ability to recombine and to mutate is eight times faster than any other known virus, so it's very likely this will recombine with current other flus like H three N two, which is a current flu this winter and spring uh, with H7 and 3 or some other flu so if it recombines we're going to have a combination of characteristics of this and another flu and that super flu the new recombinant which could arrive as early as the fall could be much more deadly than the H7 and 9 and have a different pattern of behavior so uh, well, my right. guess is that because of, yeah my guess is we're going to see a recombinant of this flu either later this year or early next and that new recombinant is going to be like the, the slayer of nations so we're very close to disaster here. Well, and don't forget about the uh, variation in the um, in the SARS virus, uh, not the SARS virus, in the uh, coronavirus that, that they have now in Germany and in um, Europe. It came out of Saudi Arabia, and that could be another bioweapon that will be heading this way. Yeah, yeah. The novel well, coronavirus. The novel coronavirus surely has the uh, the patterns that suggest that it was bioweaponized. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, too. Now, I don't know if it was weaponized by Saudi Arabia or if the enemy of Saudi Arabia weaponized it and introduced it into Saudi Arabia. Well, but, my uh, guess is be if it came from anywhere, it came from the biopreparat scientists that were imported into Iran. Uh, and that's why the latest announcement that uh, they quote, said that they might have used chemical weapons in Syria. So they're now trying to toy with the idea of the military-industrial complex dragging America by the neck into yet another war with Syria and Iran. This is not a war, as it told people, that was going to be very nice. Uh, in fact, one of the things that happened 24 years ago, one of the very first visions I had was I was taken up high above the earth to look down, and I saw the Strait of Hormuz. I didn't even know what it was. I was told it was that. I had to go back to the Encyclopedia Britannica because we didn't have all the fancy Internet back then. And this was the final event. If there's any attack on Syria and Iran, this will unleash literally the bottomless pit, which is biological weapons, because they're not like nuclear weapons. They don't stop when you say stop. And um, by the way, if you're out there and you want to ask a question of our panel, we're having trouble connecting with Alexander Bachman. We've had phone troubles here at the studio for a while. And Alexander sometimes is off doing some interesting things. He did send me some interesting links here. He talked about nanofactories and the strategic defense of Earth policy, uh, which, of course, is a LaRouche document. The, the fact is we're moving into a time when we're, we're going to see a kind of barrage of not only meteor strikes, which will increase, but also of uh, action at a distance, uh, causing increased volcanism and earthquakes, and the very grave likelihood that ne- this fall with the Ison comet, which I think that everyone, including Major Ed Dames, is thinking this is the Blue Kachina. I think we're moving into what I call real serious, what we call birth pangs, which will precede the peace treaty, which will precede the last seven years. Now, a lot of people are thinking the last seven years doesn't exist. They're just wrong. Uh, seven years, God has decreed the same prophecy that prophesied the uh, Jesus, which was right down as accurate as, as you can imagine, reserved seven years to deal with the two houses of Israel at the time of the end. Now, the nation of Israel is not Israel. Israel is two houses, Ephraim and Judah. 
Judah is a half tribe of Benjamin. The other ten tribes are primarily the North Europeans, all the way from the Scandinavians who later become the Vikings, who were the kind of rabble. Uh, but there are a lot of regular citizens, too. They were basically the pirate groups on the coast. Uh, and most people don't realize that all of the tribes in Northern Europe, the Germans, the Irish, the Scots, the, the British, the Welsh, the Scandinavians, all these groups were actually the northern tribes of Israel, cast off by the uh, Assyrians. And they had the same policy as the Russians to bring people thousands of miles from their home, disconnect them from the land, and of course they fell back into paganism because the Druidic leaders were actually pagan leaders who were apostate, uh, Druidic, um, Aaronic priests. And they were a super class, and they fell back into the most horrendous paganism that started with basically the Temple of Solomon and 700 uh, pagan wives. And uh, that's why if you look at the highest levels of Masonism, uh, you always find that the uh, issue of Druidism and high-level Masonic things is basically reinvented paganism. That's all this is, panthe- pantheistic paganism. Um, recently I've been watching uh, the miniseries Vikings, and it's, un- and it's disgustingly realistic. Um, and it just shows you not that long ago, which is a thousand years ago, these people were, you know, a raiding, killing machine. And, uh, you know, bigger than the average population of Europe by a foot or so, uh, armed with uh, some of the most advanced weapons and tactics. They're like special forces coming in and just slaughtering uh, through Britain, through Northumbria and other places. And uh, I don't think people realize the forces that drove that. It was driven by... Uh, uh, Robert Felix mentions it many times in his book, but not by fire but by ice. We're heading into an ice age, and by next year it'll be very evident that the fools out there are trying to push this, including uh, David Suzuki in Canada, who's an idiot, and the other idiots out there that try to push global uh, warming when, in fact, we're moving toward an ice age. And, in fact, the southern hemispheric uh, ice sheet, the Ross ice sheet, is expanding at a dramatic rate, and even in areas where in the north where there is a permafrost showing and areas of the uh, oceanic um, ice sheet uh, melting, it's because below them is heating from the Gakau Range, which is 1,500 miles long, volcanic range that's as high as the Swiss Alps. So we're seeing increased under-oceanic volcanism occurring. At the same time, we're having a, a decrease in temperatures, and that's why when people are saying, and they're scratching their heads saying, well, gee, how is this happening that we're having such dramatic cooling? And they're now trying to blame it and say, well, because there's melting in the Arctic, the melting in the Arctic is because, like boiling a pot of water, it's boiling from below because volcanism is going crazy in the Arctic, under oceanic. Plus, we're having increased ultraviolet light, and UVC and D will melt ice and will penetrate deeper than regular ultraviolet light, uh, infrared light. So we're, we're seeing a number of things from space weather and from under oceanic volcanism that are driving this, but we're heading into a at least a monitor type ice age. And uh, the thinning of the ozone layer... Uh, things like strobing ultraviolet light from a major CME is going to blast crops to pieces and uh, will knock out communications. And the globalists are in a panic that they're going to lose control, so they want to get total control. That's why they're trying to grab the guns. That's why John's report here from Federal that talks about the gun, the bullets, uh, they want to get control of your guns and bullets, even in calibers they don't use. And that's why we have these these jackasses that write articles to try to attack people like Alex who are doing a fan, fine job of exposing them and finally getting enough press that the Congress is embarrassed into the fact they have to deal with special committees to figure out what the hell's going on with 1.6 billion bullets being bought even in calibers they don't use so they can choke off the Second Amendment to the citizenry to protect themselves. So, And your comments, because what I see happening here with the... Boston shooting, which is basically Chechen terrorists that are being totally handled at a distance with a with a short choke chain from the FBI and CIA. We even know that that uh, Tamilan Zanayev uh, literally attended the CIA conference. The Russian security FSB monitor him. Uh, they interviewed him and put him on a watch list in 2011, and yet they say they didn't know these guys in the public media. And if you listen to and look at the reports from. Uh, uh, which I'll post up today, the reports from uh, one of the most brilliant minds out there, Joel Skousen, World Affairs Brief. Uh, it's just disgusting that uh, they want us to believe the lies. That's why the regular media now is at the point where there's no way you can believe a damn thing that the regular media says and the government. They are complete liars. If anything is coming out of their mouth, it is fabrications, lies, and it keeps changing as new data comes out all the time. What your comments? Well, I, I do want to congratulate the Boston Police Department for catching um, whatever his name is, Zarnick. Um, yeah, but they shouldn't uh, have done it that way. I mean, there's, the way they did it was was ham-handed and ridiculous. 
uh, they didn't do it a proper way at all. Well, uh, and then they, they, they fabricated all kinds of things, like supposedly he ran over his brother and there was no evidence in the autopsy he did. They fabricated, the story was just so much garbage, even for the local police there, it was just sickening. And uh, what we need to do is we don't want to turn each city into a terror state where they can go and kick down your door and tell you to hold up your hands, you might be working with the bombers. You know, how ridiculous. And treating women that are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s like they're, like they're terrorists and other people sitting down for dinner. Uh, you know, to me, this is, uh, and again, another thing to cow the population, like take off your shoes to go on the security line in the airport. Don't have any gels, no more over three or four ounces of fluids. You might be trying to create a uh, peroxide bomb inside the aircraft, which is BS. And as a chemist, I know the only thing you do is probably burn your hair or your hands. You're not going to set up a fire that's going to blow up an aircraft. It's just ridiculous. It's like the idea that if you have box cutters, you can take over an aircraft. It's ridiculous. Well, you know that all the the food that you, all the things you buy at a grocery store now are are put into a database. And if you buy over, if you buy two of anything, or you know, if it looks like you're hoarding, you get put on a list right now. If you buy any canning supplies, you get put on a list because they think that you're going to. Uh, it's on Patriot uh, Act One. Patriot Act One says if you hoard more than two weeks of any food or supplies, you're put on a special list so they can go and come by your home and apprehend it. I'm going to give back my guns one bullet at a time, plus I have unconventional weapons. And I'm posting up more unconventional weapons plans on my site so people can then figure it out or go elsewhere and get ready. Uh, the government needs to know, don't even start the fight. If you think you're going to get away with this kind of crap, forget it. Forget it, okay? If you bring foreign troops on here, if you send these guys in to die in their black ski masks and their flak jackets, their little body armor won't stop what we have. It won't. They're going to die trying to be minions for the idiots. And they're going to put themselves in danger. There's no need. Police only operate at the pleasure of the public. If they misuse the public, it's dangerous to go in an area. That's why any policeman anywhere, whether it's Watts uh, in, uh, in Los Angeles or it's anywhere else, uh, you do not go into an area where you, the public doesn't respect you because you're going to die. And if you abuse the public, like these people are systematically abusing them, they're going to end up finding that it is so dangerous. It's like redcoats walking into an area to abuse the local citizenry of early America. It's a the cross on their backs to show this is where you put the musket ball. Uh, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> well, well, yeah, we don't have the the arms though that the uh, the defense. We don't need to. We don't need to. I'll give you an example. I talked to uh, Aquasasni and the Mohawk Indians in uh, northern Quebec because I had a home between Ontario and Quebec uh, so for some years, and I had a family house sitting who was a police officer in the OPP, Ontario Provincial Police, was also a half Mohawk and half Scott, and his wife was uh, his wife was Mohawk, 100% uh, Algonquin uh, Indian, and uh, he told me that... Uh, so they told me exactly what they do. I said they got rocket propelled grenades, 50 caliber machine guns. They have tactics. Uh, if anybody thinks if they're big guns and they're helicopters and other things and they're drones, they can take us on. They're crazy. We're not the Iraqis. We're not Russians. We're not Chinese. We're not passive. They're asking for a fight. They're going to get a hell of a lot more than they imagined. And the only way they can start martial law in this country, and I've said it before and I want to repeat it, is if they bring an avian plague. A percentage of the population will succumb and, and beg to have daddy state protect them from the big bad plague. But there'll be enough of us that won't submit and we'll have things like Neutrodyne and things to protect ourselves, food, air, and water, ready, protected from whatever they're going to release. And the resistance will be mighty and they will fall. They are not going to succeed. And when all hell breaks loose, they're going to try to go underground and we can then take care of their air vents. And that's the end of them. They'll be like the Morlocks, only they're going to have a very short existence. They're not going to come up 80,000 years later like the time machine. Bad day for you if you try to take us on. Bad day. Bad day.